Welcome to Classical Chats. I'm Tiffany. I'm the host of this podcast series where I talk to anyone and everyone who loves classical music, from amateurs to professionals. Today we have Mark Alexander Chan. They're a queer amateur classical musician, and we're going to talk about how they discovered their passion for classical music, for cello, also quite a few other instruments, and uh, what their experience has been like to play music as an amateur classical musician with other professional musicians, and also their thoughts on current representation of LGBTQ plus classical musicians. I think that's good now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was uh, well timed. <laughs> just as I was trying to adjust myself. <laughs> <laughs> we can start again. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Where are you? Remind me in the world. Uh, I am in uh, Montreal, in Quebec, in Canada. Ah, bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> bonjour. <laughs> I like how uh, professional your setup is with your mic. You look more okay. like the podcaster than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, for I, my setup is mostly for for recording music. Um, Perfect. Well, we'll definitely yeah. get into that. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> first off, thanks for joining Classical Chats. Uh, first question sure. I ask uh, everyone is how your journey with classical music began. So I have um, two parts to that story, I guess. Um, hmm. The first part started when I was seven. Uh, I had um, my parents thought it be it was good for uh, for kids in general to learn an instrument, right? Mm -hmm. um, they wanted me to learn the violin, and I was a very lazy kid. So my argument was, well, you you have to hold that up with your arms, and I'm I'm going <laughs> to get tired. I don't want to play the violin. <laughs> it was for a um, so th they they were trying to sign me up for a the youth string orchestra that we had mm -hmm. in my town. Mm -hmm. um, and so they just handed me the paper and said, well, what instrument do you want to play? And I did not know what a viola, a cello, or a bass were at the time. I was seven, you know. It's like, I, I barely knew what a violin was. Uh, so I pointed a cello and I was like, this seems cool, I guess. <laughs> so that, that's how I started out on the cello. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was seven. It was just another extracurricular that my parents wanted me to do. Um, I, I didn't have a particular passion for music at the time. Uh, it was after we moved uh, halfway across the continent over here to Quebec um, and that my mother, you know, basically gave me an ultimatum. It was too expensive to continue to rent uh, a cello, to continue to pay for lessons. So she was like, if you don't want, if you want to do this professionally, I was 12 at the time. So, you know, I don't think she had a hard expectation of of, of me committing fully to it, but like, if you want to do this professionally, I'll try and make it work. Otherwise, I can't. So that was um, the point where I lost access to my cello. And, you know, over the year after that, and me ending up in band, even though I wasn't necessarily all that interested in wind instruments, uh, me ending up in band in, in my first year of high school, um, which starts in grade seven here, um, was where I actually figured out, hey, I really love music. So that, that's where I started pining for the cello again. Ah, so it was in band that you rediscovered your passion for cello, which is not necessarily yeah. the traditional kind of music you associate with cello, you know. It's usually more yeah. about <laughs> classical. So do you remember the music that you played that made you kind of want to go back to the cello? Um, so it was a lot of... So, you know, at the time I was also getting a lot more into video games. Um, I, I had, you know, been playing video games since about when I was six or eight or so. Um, but I, I discovered uh, Japanese role-playing games, JRPGs, and those always have brilliant soundtracks. So part of it was that um, I was just at the same time discovering Japanese video game music. And part of it was that band, we were playing a lot of, um, we were playing a lot of, uh, of film score music. And that was something else that was very uh you know that I, that I was starting to pay attention to that I was very keen on and uh so I, I think a combination of those two things um helped me sort of rediscover that interest in or not rediscover I guess discover that that I had this uh passion for music and now you're in a jazz band um, that focuses on video music and movie soundtracks so uh, exactly, is that yeah. related <laughs> it's not the yeah, same band though right jazz and geeks no, absolutely not. They they just started in uh, 2018, I think it was. 
Mm. Uh, very new ensemble. Um, I, I know, uh, you know, like the 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 two co-founders are fairly experienced musicians. Um, so it's not their first band, but the the ensemble itself is quite new. Uh, but yeah, that that was just out of um, you know, this was uh, back in 2018. I was starting to do a PhD, and I was like, I'm I'm missing something from my life, and I'm not actually like all that happy right now practicing the things I am on, on the cello, on the flute, on voice, I, I, I want to perform again. So I started looking for opportunities and found, well, this ensemble, which was like, hey, these are all my, these are a bunch of my interests. I, I'm not all, you know, uh, soundtrack and video game music. Like I, I'm, I mostly practice classical, uh, romantic and Baroque stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it was like I found this ensemble that just seemed to fit my interest perfectly, except for the fact that it was jazz, which I'm less familiar with. Mm. But you also are uh, very active in many things. So not only the cello, I saw you play it. Was it the, I didn't even know this instrument existed, but ocarina? Is that what, how oh, you say it? Yes. Uh, yeah, the ocarina. It's, a, it's an ancient instrument. I think uh, it used to be made like originally made out of bone or something. Mm. Um, it, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a uh, closed um, th so here's where I bring in my engineering. Um, it's a Helmholtz resonator. Instead of being a pipe, it's just a closed uh, an enclosed space with a fiddle mm. kind of like a, a recorder to make sound. But the, yeah, the it's very fascinating. Is closed. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, that that I discovered from video games as well. Um, there's a game. Ah, uh, I was games. gonna ask you how <laughs> how did you get from cello to a very unique. Um, <laughs> Not many people play that instrument, and it's uh, and then uh, to combine with video games and jazz band, it was like, whoa, that's very unique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I went, I went, got to the ocarina through the flute, mind you. Like I, I played the flute oh. for quite a few years first, but uh, the ocarina was something I discovered through uh, the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time, way before I started playing the flute, and then eventually I discovered a company that uh, makes them, and I was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, looking at the fingerings, it's like this feels very flute and recorder like. I, I let me grab one and and see how this is. And, uh, that's so I, cool, I don't though. Practice it much, but mm. I quite enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what's most important that you enjoy the experience of playing music, and I, uh, yeah. How how do you see yourself as a amateur classical musician? Something you wanted to talk about um, was imposter syndrome as an amateur classical yeah. musician. I don't know if you had any specific anecdotes you wanted to share, because I know that quite a bit of our audience here are amateur classical musicians. And um, yeah, maybe it's something you can share that can relate to many people. Yeah, so I, I find it, you know, bit. There, there's a lot of resources and I feel like a lot of the media that's out there from, you know, well-established magazines to a lot of the path podcasts I run and so on, they're very geared towards listeners, towards students, professionals. And I feel like as an amateur classical musician, if I want to perform, if I want to, you know, take my music a little bit more seriously, but I don't have a bachelor's, I don't have the network, um, the, the network I would get from university, I don't have the professional background. Um, it, it feels like it's it's harder to, you, you know, it feels like it's very hard to 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 know where to look, where to find other people to to perform with, because most of what I find that out that's out there are ensembles looking for professionals or um, or like student ensembles that are still at a you know that are operating at a at a professional level. So it's yeah, I mean, there, there's that aspect, just like. Uh, networking and finding my own opportunities, uh, which I'm slowly starting to do. Kind of, it it, it got a little bit um, uh, interrupted by the pandemic, let us say. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm slowly finding uh, those opportunities and and uh, meeting people, uh, meeting other classical musicians around to to co collaborate with. Uh, but yeah, talking about imposter syndrome that's one of the that you know that's one of the difficulties i find in doing that is that i do not have a formal uh a formal conservatory or university background in music and i'm confident enough in my abilities to know that uh my theory my analysis my ear are at least you know are, are reasonably advanced but um, because I've, I've put a lot of time, you know, into studying a lot of what you, what 
you would study at the university level on my own. But at the same time, when it comes to executing, I just do not have that same experience um, in ensemble work, in orchestra work, to um, to really be confident in what I'm doing. So it's like when I'm with a bunch of other musicians who are, you know, in their third year in university or who are just early professionals and, you know, we're friends and I know it's not a judgmental space, but if I'm being invited to perform or to record for someone's uh, composition or something, I always feel like I, I'm, I'm not sure if my skills are up to to being able to to being able to to execute at the level that's expected in real time like this, right? It's, it's very different from practicing at home or recording, where it's like you you can take whatever you know as many takes as you need for it, uh, or you can take you know you're practicing, you're you're just trying to work out those problems. But then when it comes to hey, you have to perform, we have an hour to record this, or you know we have a week to 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 get this ready. It's like I'm I'm never sure how I measure up and it's hard it's I always I, I I'm always tempted to compare myself to others right and, yeah. and and wonder am I keeping up with these other people who are a lot more experienced at least in performance than I am mm. yeah well as someone who is only just starting to get into the network and be professional it's uh I definitely can still uh, understand where you're coming from because I don't think this feeling of wondering whether you're keeping up enough with the other musicians especially if you're playing in chamber music groups I don't think that feeling really ever goes away whether you are in amateur or professional or wherever in between or outside of those labels I think it's just uh, you want to make the music sound good I think that's kind mm -hmm. of the driving force yeah. and the measurement that you kind of want to um, hold yourself up against and so I think I don't know if that makes you feel any better, but I, that's still something that I think about a lot whenever I play with other musicians. And um, it's always about, oh, maybe I could have done better or maybe I'm not fast enough or maybe uh, this should have been this way and that way so that I could match better. And so mm -hmm. um, I think it's always just a part of the music making. And um, have there been some things that you've kind of tried to change in your mindset or is it just you're still kind of learning how to get through that kind of experience i mean so uh, again i i started you know reaching out again and then trying to find opportunities to perform in 2018 and then it's been a good how many months now you know a, a year and a half roughly of barely performing i've had a few online uh opportunities but those were primarily solo um so it's like I haven't had that much time to really to practice that. And it's something where it's like, it, it's not really so, oh, sorry. Um, it's not really something I can uh, practice alone. I feel I need to have that ensemble uh, setting in order to, to be able to, to, to work through that and practice that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of the friends I've made in the past uh, two years or so have been, you know, are very, uh, very non-judgmental, very accepting people. Um, you know, very different from the from the stereotype of the the classical and competition world of of um, of justly that competition there there. So it's been a very good social group to 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 um, to try and develop that in, minus the whole pandemic thing preventing us yeah. from playing together. <laughs> Yeah, but that's great. I'm happy for you that you can find those people that can really accept you and be a, a group together and uh, be there for the music. I think I saw um, that you were part of Live Your Music, Music for People. And I, I love yeah. their mission, how it was um, to bring experience to uh, everyone and anyone, amateurs included, to just play music together. Was that um, is that still current or was that just something in the past? Uh, yeah, that's well. It's uh, also got a bit interrupted and then ended up on Zoom for mm. a while. Um, they're just starting back up uh, at uh, Concordia mm. at my uh, at my alma mater um, uh, in person. But because of the con restrictions, it's only for student and staff and anyone who has a, a university ID now instead of being open to the public. Um, so I, I'm I wasn't ever you know formally involved with them at an organizational level, but uh, I've I've. I was a participant for a long time um, from like, I think from, from 2018 or like early 2019 as well. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's a really great environment 
um, a lot of the way that they they talk about music isn't maybe the way that I think about it. So there there is sort of that disconnect of uh, this feels cheesy the first time you know when when we started and the way that we were they were talking about this like this felt feels a little bit cheesy. This isn't quite how I conceptualize music. But the way that we play music, you know, it, at that point, it's it's beyond the 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 it's beyond words. It's it's the music itself, and that has always been great. Uh, so even if it's not the language that I really personally use to think about music, once we get into it, it's just it's music. We're just all playing music together, and that includes, you know, like I'd say a good two thirds uh, of the the people there have relatively well. That depends. It's in the music department, so sometimes we have more. But you know, half the two thirds of the people do not have any musical experience or have fairly limited musical experience, and they're just picking up a drum or a xylophone or you know whatever uh, is available there and and playing music and just by following the facilitator and following the other the other people with a bit more experience. It's like it sounds great and and it's a lot of fun without you know that sounds really like fun. having to be technically difficult or having a score in front of you or having to have practiced anything it's it works really nicely yeah i'm really happy to hear that there are programs like that as part of yeah. together with classical because yeah. that was what i had started out to try to do is to create a community that's really for anyone who likes classical music and mm-hmm. just be in one place without some um I don't know, prejudices or maybe some imposter syndrome um, mm-hmm. feelings, kind of, uh, I don't know if I fit in. Like, I just wanted everyone to be in one place and uh, kind of just enjoy the music together. So it's great to have yeah. you um, kind of showing that there are also other opportunities like this uh, out there. And uh, I'm happy for you to hear that they exist. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, love all, I love programs and, and organizations like this. It's it's great to be able to get any, any kind of, you know, the, the love for any kind of music and not just listening, but making music out there. Yeah. Um, and you're in engineering right now, right? That's your profession? Yes, that's right. So how do you see music being part of that, outside of that? Or, yeah, how do you see your career and your passion coming together? Um, I tend to keep them fairly separate. Uh, I, I am interested in audio electronics, and that is one of the hobby areas that I explore once in a while. Um, haven't really done too, too much of that recently. Uh, but even then, you know, that's that's a little bit um, that that's a little bit uh, separate from classical music, which tends to be uh, tends to mostly be acoustic in nature, except for you know uh, some very contemporary music. So I, I tend not to conceptualize, like beyond my interest in, in audio electronics and audio gear, I tend not to really conceptualize my uh, musical and, excuse me, my musical and literary interests um, as part of, you know, or as linked very much to my electronics engineering and software engineering uh, interests and, and uh, professional practice. Uh, that's not to say that there's no connection between them, because you know I'm one person. I'm uh, I'm obviously influenced by both in the way that I think, uh, for better or for worse. So um, the the way I conceptualize music can sometimes be extremely analytical, and I do appreciate a very theoretic view of music. It's not how I perform or practice music, but I do feel that understanding. Uh, music that I'm studying at a very theoretical level is something that I can then translate to my to my performance um, or to, to my practice. Um, so th- things like n- understanding the structure of, um, say, the Bach suites.
understanding how it uses um, how Bach used secondary dominance helps me know where I need to uh, what I need to stress. You know what what kind of motion that I'm going for. Um, in some cases, uh, harmonic analysis also helped me just figure out what the phrasing is supposed to be because Bach's phrasing on the page, if you're not very used to how it's performed, can be weird sometimes. Yeah, especially when you have a one-line instrument and you don't really uh, mm -hmm. have an end yeah. to a phrase. It seems exactly. like it's just all 16th yeah. notes and it's just all yeah. uh, in the same same thing exactly. uh, over and over again. So yeah, I definitely with Bach, I think um, music theory helps a lot in analyzing to some degree. I don't know how in-depth you are and maybe coming from your engineering background, you have a lot more um, analytic approach to it but it definitely does help to know the harmonies and the relationship sorry there's like a fly flying around my apartment <laughs> if that is if i ever like looked away it's because i am a little bit uh scared about this fly anyway <laughs> it was just like right when you were talking about something really sincere i i had to look away for a second because it was just like Ooh. <laughs> no worries anyway. that happens <laughs> yeah um but you're also really creative you uh do some fictional writing too, no? Yeah, and I yeah. find that really interesting that you have to balance uh, the other side of the scale of the analytic, more scientific um, career aspect of engineering. And then you delve into also uh, not only music, but also poetry and fiction. Do you want to tell us anything about that? Oh, yeah. I, I, so again, like sometimes I feel like that these two things are at odds. Um, so the, the creative side, everything creative and, and everything that's more technical, uh, obviously, you know, there's a certain creative aspect to engineering. You have to, you have a problem, you have to find solutions and there, there's a creativity to that, but it feels very different. You know, it's a very sort of thinking sort of creativity, uh, and a problem, problem solving creativity versus music where a lot of that, you know, there's the technical aspect and there analytical thinking absolutely helps if I'm, you know, in an editing mindset for a poem or a story, and I'm just trying to figure out, well, do these arcs make sense? Or does my phrasing in music make sense? Uh, those are all things that are helped, I think, by my by a, a technical frame of mind. But then a lot of what I do there, you know, my end goal isn't that technique. My end goal is a very feeling sort of creativity. It's, it's much more emotional. And that's not really something that I bring into the engineering side of of uh, of anything I do, um, so you know, like I I often feel like those two frames of mind are at odds, and I think e even someone who's you know full time writer has that problem because when they're writing um, when they're writing something initially they have to be in a creative mindset, but then when they're editing it, there's the analytical. So it's not like that's exclusive to to me uh, in engineering. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I feel like those two aspects are often at odds. Um, yeah. But it's, you still are able to have so many different interests, not only from the instruments, but also different types of creative outlets. So I think it's still, it's not so much at odds, but you kind of bring it all together under your own brain and your emotions. And I think it's great that you have so many different interests. Thank you. It, it does take a little bit of work to like find the right mindset, right? It's like there, there absolutely are evenings where it's like I, I wanted to write this poem, but also I'm, I'm very much in a technical problem solving mindset right now. And <laughs> sitting down to write a poem in that mindset, I will be trying to write it from theory, from analysis, from um, mm, rather than from, from, from the heart. And so it's like you know, it's either I need to set myself into that mindset. Or I just need to, to wait until I'm, I'm in a better frame of mind for that particular activity. Hmm, that's interesting. It's like a switching a different hat. <laughs> yeah, it, it, effectively, yeah. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, two more topics, I guess. Uh, you kind of wanted to talk about the representation of um, LGBTQ. Is it LGBTQ plus? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, or did yeah. I just start? I mean, yeah. There's a couple different... There, there's a couple different um, uh, acronyms that are all common enough, right? LGBT yeah. is a, a fairly classic one. LGBT plus Q as the queer. Um, sometimes you see two spirit added to uh, to it, so LGBTQ two S plus. Um, I tend uh. to stick to LGBTQ plus because it's all inclusive. Queer tends to be 
intended as a catch-all mm-hmm. um, without being, you know, getting too long. Uh, that said, there is something to be said about the two-spirit and the in- American indigenous aspect when, you know, in Canada and the U.S., uh, indigenous people have been through so much, right, and are still going through so much. So there is an argument for that. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of acceptable forms, I guess. Uh, queer for short, when we're just talking orally, because it, it, it's shorter. <laughs> well, thank you for the explanation, because I, I didn't want to disrespect anyone. And I have actually, I, I don't see the plus as much as I do with um, the LGBTQ. So I wanted to kind of um, ask you a, a little bit about that. But you wanted to talk about the representation of queer classical musicians. And um, is there anything that you kind of want to um, comment on and tell us about how maybe we could do better or maybe some things that we could do to yeah better represent uh, the diversity of different kinds of classical musicians so i i feel like you know like uh, traditionally the classical music world has had this problem of well um we tend to celebrate the white male musicians uh, or white male composers at least the most right uh historically that's been kind of a problem um i i feel like when it comes to women that's getting better it's still you know not uh not exactly representative but it's it's getting a lot better um and uh like i i've discovered lily boulanger in the past like year and a half or so or no two years now and her music is absolutely wonderful by the way um but so when it comes to uh the lgbtq plus community and even to an extent i feel the uh asian diaspora there isn't that much um there we still don't have that much visibility and one of the things that i found uh seems to be very common and so i i should preface this i'm by no means an expert on this i'm not you know well well connected enough to the lgbtq classical music community and to the professional classical music community to really know all that much of what the the what that's like um but one of the things that i've noticed uh seems to be that a lot of uh queer musicians or queer classical musicians don't tend to don't tend to be very vocal about their identities in uh, their public life. Um, there have been a lot that I've discovered were queer where it's like they, they absolutely do not make that part of their of their website or their or their you know public facing media, but they will you know mention it on a podcast. Um, something else that seems to be an issue, and again, this is from what I, th- this in particular is from what I've heard. Uh, uh, other queer musicians uh, mention uh, is that in the professional world there does tend to be uh, the problem of if you are open about your your identity then it's a lot more likely that you're going to end up getting a whole bunch of um, of uh, of contracts during Pride Month and it'll be these very performative uh, sort of um, token queer uh, you know the, here's your token queer person uh, during Pride Month, and then other times of the year, it seems like it's it's a lot more of a problem as an open queer per- as an open out queer person to 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 get contracts to get jobs as a as a musician. Mm. Um, so again, this isn't quite my world because you know existing in in uh, in the uh, in an amateur sphere, I'm I'm not really as affected by this. But these are things that I've heard as as problems, and otherwise just in terms of trying to discover queer musicians myself i've been wanting to um I, i've been wanting to do a uh, a vocal to to put together a vocal recital uh celebrating queer musicians whether contemporary living uh sorry queer composers whether contemporary uh living classical composers or uh historical ones like benjamin britten for example who i just found out a few days ago was gay i don't know how i missed this i actually didn't know that either but i think i'm not the only one (laughs) no i mean i think sometimes when it comes to music especially classical music um this has nothing to do with lgbtq or not i think the question of identity of the artist and the Mm -hmm. musicians or the composer's identity and their personal life i think 
some sometimes um, it's part of their philosophy of music that they don't reveal that part of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really just about the music. But at the same time, I think socially speaking, it um, can be quite isolating if you're trying to look for that and mm-hmm. try to find that connection. I think it's, um, yeah, it can create some conflicts and problems perhaps but um yeah i hope that it can kind of continue to improve and really um not have so much of a stigma um one thing that i noticed um from a uh from a project that someone did for their doctoral work i think um is that they decided for the doctoral work to perform uh queer musicians uh this was a, a cellist who decided to start performing queer musicians doing recitals specifically sorry, queer composers uh, doing recitals uh, specifically uh, celebrating queer co- composers. And one of the things that uh, he mentioned, I think he, well, they, I, I don't actually remember who it is anymore. Um, one of the things that they mentioned uh, on their website talking about this work is just how much, uh, how much a lot of people related to that music more just because it was part of, of, uh, their community, right, of our community as as uh, as queer people, um, and so you know there there is that, like you said, there's that social aspect to both our uh, to representation of queer musicians and composers, and just the ability to relate to other people who've had similar experiences and who have similar identities as your own. That I think is is an important aspect um, that isn't the music, but that still relates to the music and how it commu- how you you communicate through the music to to uh, to an audience. Yeah, I definitely other understand. members of the community. Yeah, I definitely understand that it's um, very important to really show the human story and the. And, yeah. I mean, not to keep promoting or anything, but it's um, something that I've been thinking about. Whether it's with my own YouTube or what I try to do on social media or through together with classical, kind of just bringing more forward a little bit of the human story and to really create a sense of community so that everyone can be closer to the music or maybe be more likely to go into um, the music and experience it together so i'm very glad to have you talk about this this hasn't been really um talked about on classical chats or yeah. actually I'm, I'm i, I to don't have know the chance to talk about it too <laughs> yeah i'm very lucky to have a platform and so uh, i'm always looking for ways to share it with some different um kinds of people who are in classical music. So yeah, it's been very interesting to talk to you about this. Um, last question is music yeah. recommendation. Well, yeah, Boulanger would be one of them. Um, so yeah. <laughs> recently, I, recently I had, I, I would have gone with um, Lily Boulanger's Reflet, which is a, a fairly short, um, uh, a fairly short uh, melody and an art song that she wrote in 1911, I think. Absolutely beautiful. Um, but Given my, uh, so I, I found out that a friend of mine passed away um, a couple of weeks ago. Oh no. And so I've been feeling um, Faure's, uh, Gabriel Faure's Elegie, Opus 24, for cello mm. and piano, a lot mm. more recently. And that's one that's sort of come back to me a couple times over, you know, over my life. Um, whenever, whenever I'd, fe- whenever I'd, I'd experience a loss, that's always one that, comes back through so you know mm-hmm. for for right now that's sort of the the piece that's that's f- uh the most prominent in my head i think mm, well i'm so sorry to hear about your loss but also Thank i'm you. glad you found um some music that can really accompany mm-hmm. your current um mindset so i hope people will enjoy this piece i think i've heard it before and um every time that i hear an elegy L- is it how you say it in french elegy yeah elegy every time i hear whether it's uh, of Rachmaninoff's or uh, other composers that I can't think of, maybe Tchaikovsky also wrote one. Um, it's just always so gripping, and the music just really speaks to you more than any words can. So um, I look forward there, to listening there to it again. Where, there are pieces where the story is very is very apparent, right? It's some mm-hmm. some pieces. If you look at a lot of sonatas, a lot of concerti, it's a little bit hard to to. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to decide how you want to interpret it emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but the elegies, they're always, you know, they're always very barefaced in what they're trying to say. They're, they're, there's, very raw. you know, not just in the fact that they're mourning in some way, but just 
the particular way that they're mourning is not something that I find, you know, I, I find it's always very easy to 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 give a face, give a, a character, give actions or ideas to those to the musical ideas, whereas other pieces can be a little bit dicey trying to figure out, well, what what is the saying? How can I interpret this? Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and classical chats. I think we've talked about some very interesting different types of topics from different instruments that I'm discovering through you. And um, yeah, it's been great to have you be on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed hearing their experience. Be sure to check out our other episodes of Classical Chats with guests from different walks of life to hear about their stories with classical music. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support Together with Classical's current fundraising, please check the links in the description. Thank you very much for your support.